Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I'm getting better, I think, at the at the music crossfade, or maybe I'm deluding myself. Welcome, everybody. What's happening? It's another episode of Fantasy NBA Today, Sports Ethos presentation, kind of churning these bad boys out these days, and I know my silly YouTube setup, it, it persists, but I do with it what I can. And today... We have one of my favorite guests on the show. I always, I really do. Okay, so I'm actually going to throw him on the screen right now. Um, I got to say, Alex, you and I, uh, we see eye to eye on a lot of things. I think maybe even beyond fantasy basketball. I don't know that I typically laugh more on a show than we do just talking about fantasy basketball players. I don't, I don't know how to make heads or tails of that. But Alex Rickling on the show, welcome back, my good man. It's always a pleasure to have you. It's always great to be here. Yeah, I, uh, I, for some reason, this is one of the first times we've actually done this where I've been in my own home. And so my memory of our, our guest pods is just me in my in-laws house, like kind of cracking up and a half hour taking an hour because we were enjoying ourselves. Yeah, I don't know what the heck we're talking about, but uh, I always leave the pod feeling like that was fun. Yeah. I don't know, remember what the hell we talked about, but that was fun. <laughs> Uh, you guys can find Alex on Twitter at Rickling. That's just the last name, R-I-K-L-E-E-N. Go hunt him down on social media, especially with the season right around the corner. I say this so often. It's a hellscape, but you need it for fantasy basketball. Um, I am at Dan Bespris over there, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. There's just things that happen, Alex, and rapid fire. And if you're not on Twitter and you're in any kind of first-come, first-serve league, someone's going to beat you to it. So yeah. um, follow a limited number of accounts. Don't read the replies, but do get your fantasy basketball information and you'll, you know, get out of this thing with your head and on your shoulders. Uh, but Alex was, as per usual, a part of the preseason industry mock, which I'll now throw up in the background for everybody to take a look at. And you had the sixth pick. And like usual, we're going to go through your team. Some thoughts on different spots there. I might challenge you on a name or two. But generally, I like to let the guests have the floor on this show. And at the end, we'll go over a couple of the names that maybe didn't quite get to you that you were hoping would. Same format as usual, but for anybody that hasn't been a part of it in the past, that's what we're going through here. So starting at the top, Steph Curry at the sixth slot. I think the only question I have for you there is, I presume you were debating between Steph and Tatum. Why go with Steph over Tatum? I actually wasn't um i think steph over tatum is a relatively clear call to me um other than durability steph's just got tatum beat um and durability matters like I, you know but it's also hard to predict you know as josh always says uh you're uh you know you're not injury prone until you are and you're injury prone until you're not uh you know Kevon Looney missed how many games in his first two season and is now like the second most Iron Man player we've got. Um, so, but I mean, Curry's just per game, like by any measure that we have, a better fantasy producer than Tatum. And I'm kind of surprised to see how much um, the community at large is viewing Tatum as an equal or better player. Um, I just kind of don't see it. I, I don't get me wrong. I do have Tatum right there in the seven or eight spot. Um, uh, but to me, he's, he's not the sixth guy. It's Curry there. Do you think some of that is the, the strong gravitational pull towards head to head where everybody is extra concerned about getting the additional games out of their top guys? I know for me, like a Roto player, I'm usually looking at per game more so uh, but I know no, everybody's thinking, okay, who's going to be upright in my fantasy playoffs or too much of a coin flip? I, I mean, maybe I, that's not how I'm thinking about it when I'm building a head to head league. This was, you know, in theory, a head to head mock. Yeah. Um, so it's possible that that's impacting people. Um, I think it's just more the shiny new object. Um, you know, Tatum is entering his prime. If, if one of these players is getting better and the other is getting worse, it's clear that Tatum's the one getting better. Um, but a slight improvement from Tatum and a slight decline from Curry could still have Curry ahead in the per game ranks. 
your second round coming back and this is you gonna everybody's gonna get to enjoy me doing um my attempted math on the fly i believe this is pick 19 did i do it i think i got it yeah uh devin booker who i'm a little bit I'm a little bit worried about, I mean, he's obviously a super safe play because he's going to score and he's going to do all of his stuff. And he and KD are, I would assume, kind of a little bit ahead of Bradley Beal on that club. But uh, what's the thought process behind Booker at 19? As much as I like Cade, I just, I I feel like, so, uh, you know, Cade went two picks later. Um, It went Booker, Towns, Cade. Um, as much as I like Cade, I do feel like I can't just, I can't sort of internally justify, uh, someone who we're hoping will get there over someone like Booker and Cat, who we've already seen it from. Um, uh, so he, he was someone who sort of passed my mind, but I, I don't know. Part of it was sort of, it, there was something kind of fun and amusing to me about, starting the draft with players who had like almost identical stat profiles <laughs> and just to sort of see how that built, that was also a motive in taking Garland at three. It was like, these players are all very similar. Let's keep it going. <laughs> how Steph and, you know, uh, 95% of Steph and 85% of Steph, let's keep them coming. Um, and <laughs> I did that as long as I could. I ran out after three. Uh, So there was something I did. I do. But seriously, though, Steph is a pretty good all around guy who leaves you with a lot of flexibility in what direction to go in the future. And I thought that adding Booker to that um, sort of reinforced that uh, while also giving me a pretty comfortable advantage, uh, at least in threes and and probably free throw percentage and and hopefully... um, points and assists, although I would still need to do some work there. Uh, I do believe a bounce back is coming for Towns, but that's not a given. Um, and, you know, the the addition of Beal could hurt Booker a little bit, but, you know, I'm, it's 19th pick. I'm not paying top 15. I'm paying top 20. I thought it was fine value. It, it was more safe than trying to hit a home run is kind of where I'm going with this. A lot of words to say it felt like the safest option. Yeah. You answered my, my follow-up during your answer, which was who were the other guys you were looking at? And it was basically the guys right after him there. Yeah. Um, And uh, go ahead. I'll I'll admit to having been relieved that you took bridges. Uh, I was looking at the board. (laughs) I I was looking at the board uh, right there and I wanted Booker. Like I had towns as a second place, but I was, I wanted Booker. And I was getting a little worried he wasn't going to make it to me. So I yeah, did appreciate I'm not, that. I'm not sure that I built the wisest team in this one. At some point, I'm going to have to break my own very wing heavy uh, top end down. I went Tatum, Bridges, Kawhi for my first three picks here. A lot of um, upside, but yeah, yeah a lot of a lot of wing. Not many rebounds, not many assists out of those three guys. But you cover like all of the peripheral things. But you already told everybody who you got in the third round, Darius Garland. And it does seem like, and I can't really fight with you here because there are so many bigs available this season. You're able to get your guards early, lock them in. I do think mentally, one of the things that, that people need to get over is like you take your guards and you think, Oh, I'm way behind everybody else in a big man cat. But you've done that knowing when you're going to try to make that up. So, uh, beyond just the Garland pick, because I feel like Garland is a very reasonable, also very safe, what did you say, 85% of Steph pick. What is it about the guard path here for you that just felt like the right opportunity? Um, I mean, again, part of it's the the players available. Uh, I have done a lot of, as, as other people who listen to other pods know, I've done a lot of uh, Walker Kessler in the third round. Um, but was trying to sort of keep things diverse a little bit and trying to build something a little bit different here. Uh, I generally speaking, I think that you're much more likely to find a um, 12, tw- a 12 point 10 rebound one block a guy on waivers than you are somebody gets six assists. Um, and so, I am often willing to go guard heavy early 
on the assumption that not only am I building whatever I'm building in the mid rounds of the draft, but also that's going to be the area where I have the easiest time, especially if you're active and attentive early in the season hunting waivers. Um, uh, but also, I mean, some of the players I got later, like uh, Julius Randall is probably a pretty good value in the sixth, in the fifth round. Uh, Dan Gafford's probably a pretty good value in the eighth round. Like there are some of these bigs who are going later than I think I would have designed if I were the king of things. Your fourth round, uh, you did finally end your um, early season, Steph and uh, bro. <laughs> well, I don't. We got to come up with a fun name for the this the Steph and also Steph and also Steph. It's like a slightly dirtier mirror every time. Yeah, you you're extending I, the infinite. A uh, reference that like. 10 of your listeners are going to get uh, the multiplicity movie. Uh, oh my God. The, <laughs> the increasing multiplicity clones of Steph. <laughs> um, I remember that movie vividly because uh, <laughs> there was a kid in my carpool who's now actually our family dentist uh, <laughs> who loved to quote the line. She touched my Pepe Steve. Uh, <laughs> and so that's like embedded deep in my brain. And that i I, I think that was one of the like later multiplicities. Uh, multiplicities. I, I, I've like never even seen the whole movie, but um, <laughs> my like my group at summer camp, we had two kids with the same first name and one very clearly kind of followed the other one. And, and, and <laughs> our, our counselor referred to him as the fourth multiplicity clone <laughs> of kid. the first, at least which is not a compliment, but yeah, it at least was funny. Memory. They'll never get the the like early mid nineties reference that was thrown at them. <laughs> these, these young tykes. Uh, so you went OG, by the way, in yeah. the fourth round. Um, I'm thinking along with you here. You have three very good guards. None of them really. Well, I guess Garland's okay defensively, but your team was lacking in steals in a in a pretty reasonable way, considering you had guards and big men were probably not going to be the guys that made up for it. So I'm assuming. Number one, you like the value. Number two, he provided a stat that your team could use a little boost in. How'd I do? Um, I, I the only thing you're kind of that you left out, uh, you you did well, but the only thing you left you out is uh, at this point we're four rounds in. Uh, nary a shot block has been scented. Uh, <laughs> at this point, I'm I'm pretty clearly going to be punting that. Um, and so someone who is good on defense, but specifically steals and not blocks. I like, and also, uh, all of these guards I have, they're, they're good scores, but also good shooters. Um, and so to ha to be as strong in assists and threes as I am without a real anchor, um, from the field was something that I liked and OG kind of kept that going. Uh, what did he shoot? 46% last year, 47% last year. 46% last year. Um, uh, yeah, he's been above 46% three of his three of his four years. Um, so I liked that element of it as well was um, I'm building my sort of I'm a monster in threes. I'm a monster uh, in free throws. And I am at least competitive in field goal percentage, despite not having a big still. Was there anybody else near that pick that you were considering in the fourth? Because you had mentioned you're a big Walker Kessler guy. He just didn't yeah. fit the build for this one. He went actually right. fifth in this draft. I was so sad about how late he went, but I just, I didn't think he fit the build. Um, <laughs> it, it hurt. I think I actually like said in the chat that I was offended. Uh, I was offended <laughs> that how far everyone else let him slide. Um, I took it as a personal attack. <laughs> That's fair. Uh I would have loved to have taken Jamal Murray if he had made it to me. He went a couple picks earlier. Um, oh, you really were going for all Steffs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really wanted to keep it going. Um, uh, I considered Jalen Brown, who went a few picks later. He was probably the other one I had my eye on. Um, and I I mean, I definitely, I looked at Zion. I looked at the hard pivot to including Walker Kessler. I didn't, I thought the hard pivot didn't make sense. Um, I thought it was a little too early to go for Zion. Uh, Jalen Brown, I just thought OG was a slightly better fit. Head-to-head, uh, -head, I'm going to guess Jalen Brown finishes higher in the sort of traditional Z-score rankings, but I thought OG fit a little bit better. 
You're fifth and sixth. Uh, you're you're doing another multiplicity thing here. Um, Julius <laughs> Julius Julius Randall in the fifth, Kyle Kuzma in the sixth, and and you know these are um, very high usage power forward types who have their issues in the percentages. One of them more than the other. The you know the 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 bad duplicate or the bad <laughs> clone. Um, these ones actually surprised me given your team build, not because they don't block shots because that does kind of fit what you're doing, but because you do have a guard heavy team that didn't have a field goal issue. Did you now create that with these two guys and kind of say, screw it. I'm like basically punting like the traditional big stats besides perhaps rebounds. Um, I was, I, I mean, that's a reasonable critique. I think, I was more focused on, and this is some. This is a mistake that I am prone to in drafts. Um, uh, is I was more focused on like I'm looking at you know the the list of ranks and and I'm sorting by big men who don't block, uh, um, be, and because when you're punting something, you know one of the one of the advantages to punting is it changes the valuation of players. Players who block shots are boosted up the rankings, and I no longer care about that. So that's effectively a wasted boost up the rankings. And so by focusing on players who don't block shots, you can focus on players who, according to your specific team build, are more valuable. But in so doing, you can almost get blinded by, um, like, hey, Yes, I'm optim. I'm no longer wasting uh, money spending on blocks, but I might actually be hurting myself a little bit here by taking two people who are poor field goal shooters. I think I'm a little more. You described Kuzma and Randall as a little bit worse field goal percentage shooters. I think than is fair. You know, they're not forty two percent. They're not. They're not forty percent guys. They're forty four, forty five not good for a forward um but <laughs> but but not terrible um and both of them uh both of them i do think are kind of undervalued in drafts right now and both of them um can can do some some passing you know with curry and booker i've got two point guards who do get some decent assist numbers um but they're not getting the doncic or halliburton um, levels of eight, nine plus. So I did still need a little bit of help and assists. And I liked that, especially Randall was going to help with that. Uh, you're, you might be right that I might, I, perhaps I should have paid a little bit more attention to the damage that he would have, that, uh, uh, that they would have done in, in the field goal percentage. Um, you know, I did consider DeMar DeRozan in, in, uh, the Randall spot. By the way, I was I was grateful there because you knew I was taking his old play. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, I was I was very much considering that, but I, I decided I wanted those extra rebounds more than than anything else. Um, <laughs> my, but, my, I mean, it's a re reasonable critique. You left me another wing. I couldn't say no. My team was <laughs> my team was four out of five wings at that point, but it's fine. We'll. <laughs> Can, we can destroy my team some other day. Uh, oh, I'm not going to destroy your next pick. I, I really. Oh, did I? Tyrese Maxey in round six is, I think, just incredible value. I don't think I actually. I might not have taken him at six seven. I, I think that the sixth round, mid sixth round, is way too late for both Maxey and Kuzma. Um, so I, in terms of overall value, I'm pretty happy about Kuzma there. Whether or not he fits my team is it. Uh, as well as I hoped is a different conversation. Um, but I think both of those guys should be going at least 10 picks higher. Yeah, I was, I was pretty surprised that Maxi was still there. Um, I think I, I don't remember exactly what was going on at this part of the draft, but I'm pretty sure that I was looking at some guys like six, seven, eight slots deeper down the board thinking, all right, well, this guy's not going to get back to yeah. me. What do I do instead? And then he was there and that made it a whole hell of a lot easier. Yeah. Um, before we get to your seventh pick, I want to make our faces a little bigger for a second. So folks can once again, see your Twitter handle at Rickling R I K L E E N. We're talking to Alex Rickling here, breaking down his team. We'll get you guys some little nuggets at the end of the show as well. Uh, seventh rounder Wendell Carter jr. Um, big man who doesn't block. I get it. 
I figured this out now after you told me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. Yeah, I mean, um, like, he does all does the some other scoring, stuff. gets some rebounds, gets some assists, doesn't really block. Yeah, that one makes and, a lot of sense with your team build. And he, uh, uh, you know, and he does help with the field goal percentage. Yeah. Actually, your next few in a row, you went a little more field goalie to kind yeah. of cover that up. I really like Daniel Gafford. Actually, yeah. I just I just did a show earlier this morning where he's on my, you know, favorites beyond 100 chunk of the board. Like every time we've seen him get 27 plus minutes, he's been a force. He just never got those minutes. Yeah. And for some reason, folks kept telling me that he was always injured, but he played in he missed four games last year. Yeah, That's 72 not- the year before he's. That's pretty um, good. It is pretty good. And also, ever I mean, we all know that Gafford is expected to start this year, but I almost think we've undersold how much he's expected to, to start. Uh, I, I think we should take a moment to pause and l- take a gander at the rest of the Wizards uh, <laughs> depth chart. We got Taj Gibson. There you go. Uh, uh, the the uh, excavators are still trying to find his exact birth date, but I believe he's the second <laughs> oldest active player in the league right now. Behind um, Braun, um, I think it's Braun and then and then Taj and Chris uh, Paul's very much in that top. Chris team Paul's also. right up there, yeah. yeah. But with so um, did, did Iguodala retire officially? I think Iguodala officially retired, and I think Haslam officially retired. <laughs> So, um, no, the top of the board. So yeah, the, the top of the board kind of cleared out a little. So we got Taj Gibson. That's that's the main backup. Mike <laughs> Muscala, who I love, ten minutes of Mike Muscala per game. Not a threat for more than fifteen minutes. Uh, Xavier work. Cooks. If you know what he looks like, <laughs> then then you are unique amongst the basketball viewing uh, uh, sphere. Um, oh, man. A, a person by the name of Anthony Gill, uh, who is oh, actually, yeah. he was there last year. Yeah. He's, he's actually played a little bit. We, we are from <laughs> DFS. Know. People are going to be at least familiar with the name. Um, oh, and Daniel Mal- Gallinari as an out of position, actually often injured, also very old, <laughs> um, but like can sometimes play the the five. Oh Lord! If I had the, if I was good enough with this stuff, I would a hundred percent clip the uh, <laughs> that sequence of if you know what he looks like. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're hundred percent right. Like if Gafford is upright, he's the big man. Yeah, that's it. There, I I honestly I often. I often find that one of the issues that I have with other fantasy analysts is that people are too confident in their assertion of so-and-so is going to play 28 plus 30 plus whatever. I I honestly don't see the path to less than 28 minutes for Gafford. Um, I, I don't understand how you build this rotation without at least 28 and probably more for Gafford. I, I, I don't get it. I, I like my mind can't, can't <laughs> imagine it. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, honestly, I can't, I can't argue with you. I, I like you, I try to sort of temper the way that I talk about players. Cause yeah. saying you're certain of something is like almost a guarantee that you're going to screw it up after that. But there are situations where guys step into a much bigger role and it's weird that he's mm-hmm. not really fully being treated like that he's going in the same neighborhood of as a lot of guys who i think probably have more competition than he yeah. does so we'll see he's got a good block rate he's got a good rebound rate he's actually not horrendous he's not good at the foul line don't get me wrong but he's not a full tank free throw guy like you make at high 60s low 70s out of it that's survivable in and, and he might is. take only three three or four att- like yeah he might be three attempts a game from the line which is makes it even less bad so uh i think i actually lopped off the last round of uh on the board because i i know i was very much not available for it i don't even remember who <laughs> I got auto picked in that one um so apologies this was actually a 12 round mock um your last three i'm gonna group together i do this annually because basically once we hit pick a hundred Especially well, in an industry. Well, market. before we sure. l- l- lump the rest of them, I think we got to talk about JV for a second, just because um, I y- you set this up as a two center mock. There is not a pr- chance in uh, that I would have taken <laughs> JV 
in the ninth round in a one center league. Um, there were a bunch of players um, that I would have been much happier to take, but uh, you know, I'm trying to do this like a serious endeavor. You know, I know you're going to talk about it. I'm hopefully someone's going to learn something from listening to this TBD. Um, and, <laughs> and if you're in a multi-center league, you, you know, being able to have not just two, but at least three people who can start at center is critical, not just from the health standpoint, but also from the trades standpoint, you know, I, I do, I stand by the point of you're likely to be able to pick up, uh, you know, a 12, 10 and one guy off waivers, but you're still, there's still going to be a robust trade market for functional big men, for for functional center eligible big men in a two center league. Um, And so I felt like if I was treating this like a serious draft, I had to take Jonas there. Um, where, you know, if this wasn't a two center league, even if I I might've even gone Rob Williams, I could have stayed at the position, but taken someone with more upside and, and, but a much lower floor, you know, Rob Williams gets hurt a lot and he could be just the pure backup, uh, to Aiton limiting his workload this year, but at least we know he's got this massive upside and I'd rather that than JV in a one center league, but it was a two center league. So I had to take, had to do that. Yeah. You left me a couple. Of, I needed a big man here as well. I, I felt like I was uh, short on blocks because my first big was Vooch and he's not blocking a ton of shots anyway. So I actually was in a similar mode, not because I needed a center because I got uh, Rick Lean and Bespris powerhouse Brooke Lopez in the seventh. I mean, you and I have shared many, many a cup of soup over Brooke Lopez over the years. <laughs> uh, but also, oh um, I, I was able to pick between Capella and Mitchell Robinson there. And so I, yeah. that worked out pretty well for so, my team. I, I, I Just sticking on this two center thing, one last point on that is in the seventh round, uh, half of the picks were centers. Um, you know, you, you, you in a two center league, you get to a point where anyone with a pulse who can like be a, a top 100 center is going to go. And so you've got to anticipate that you got to know that that's coming. Um, you know, I think there were like five out of five out of 10 picks in a row in round seven and three out of the five picks before that or something, something I forget. Uh, I guess there was like a mini run in the middle of the sixth, but there was a bunch of centers that went real fast. Um, so, you know, if you're, um, someone picking early in round six there that, you know, took, they took John ja Morantz or miles bridges. No, they probably wouldn't have done that anymore. Um, oh, instead yeah. of a center, yeah. in, <laughs> instead of a center, um, you know, they didn't eight, get eight names them. got off the board before they got another try. Yeah. It's really, it is an interesting when you're able to look at it just as like the colors on the page in front of you here, yeah. you can see the way it is. Not many going early because uh, everybody yeah. wants to load up on their guards, and then just an absolute truckload yeah. between Kessler, who, by the way, we do have uh, a comment that I figured you'd enjoy. No Walker Kessler in the fourth, a surprise from Rick Lee. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, but Kessler in the, the fifth, brand is strong. <laughs> yeah, I'm, the brand is strong, man. Well done. Uh, but yeah, four of them went in the fifth, three more in the sixth, five in the seventh. Oddly, yeah. none in the eighth. I don't know how yeah. that happened. But then five more in the ninth and only two more the rest of the way after that. Yeah. So once Mitchell Robinson was off the board, the only two centers that I can show on this screen, and there might have been one that nope. got taken in the 12th round, were Nothing Al Horford and Evitza Zubats. Um, technically, Bobby Portis is center eligible and he went in the 12th round. But um, Oh, there you go. But no, no true center in the 12th yeah. round. Um, okay. So that well done. Thank you for taking that question off the board, your, uh, 10th and 11th. And if you want to talk about your 12th, who's not pictured on the YouTube screen, uh, Shaden Sharp in Portland, uh, Dan Bespris fan favorite, Mike Conley, uh, in the 11th. And then I can actually flip over and, uh, uh, Boyan, Boyan Bogdanovich in the 12th. I had it on a, a browser tab as well. Uh, tell me a little bit about those three, and then if there was anything else that maybe you were hoping would get to you or guys that you were eyeballing late 
who are the uh, the Rick Lean specials here uh, potentially besides those guys? Sure, I took a screenshot of my um of my queue at the end of the draft because because <laughs> I wanted to like have that available. That's to talk incredible about prep, by the way, yeah, for a man welcome. with two children. I don't know how the hell you kept that in your brain. <laughs> um, so I've, I've got that ready for it for you. Um, Sharp is I, I I've been referring to him. He's he's a mystery box. He might be. He might not be very good to be determined, but, uh, the potential and opportunity are there. Um, I don't care that he might not fit my team build. I I'm, I'm taking a home run swing. And if he doesn't fit my team, then I'll trade him if he hits. And it, in the 10th round, it's late enough that if he doesn't hit, I can drop him. And it's not really a lot of pain. Uh, you know, one of my, as much as you and I always, um, talk about, not drafting rookies early um, and Sh- sharp isn't a rookie, but he's young and raw enough that he kind of falls into that bucket. Uh, you should absolutely spend at least one late pick on one of these high upside guys. Um, you know, players who jump from, you know, outside the top, top 100, 120, 130 into the top roughly 60 usually are rookies because the other players who the players who have already been in the league or have a more gradual build. Um, the problem is we're terrible at predicting which players are going to do that. Um, and so that's why I never draft a rookie early. Um, not, I haven't drafted Chet anywhere. Um, and unless scoop falls a bit, I'm not taking him anywhere, but someone like sharp, or the top name on my queue that went undrafted in our league, Derek Lively. Um, people like that, I'm, I'm targeting late because they're home run swings. Uh, and and if they hit, you know, late picks are likely going to get dropped anyways. If they hit, then there's a massive payoff. Um, Mike Conley, I just, I mean, what he's got a, he's likely the starting point guard. He's likely going to average what six, seven assists per game. Yeah, it feels um, like he's going to do what he did in Utah last year. It, yeah, um, and so how many players after pick 100 do we like think will average 6.5 assists or more? Uh, is the answer one? Yeah, I think the it, only other it, one in this draft might have been Trey Jones, who went, I think, mm, two picks before yeah. you at Sharp. That might be the I'm only like, other one. Maybe if you're super optimistic and things go right for Nemhard, maybe. But like, I don't, I don't. Is, yeah, no, is his family th- is his family that optimistic? Um, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I, it's really probably just just Conley uh, who's going to be getting that many assists that late. Um, so I love getting him late. I, uh, if again, even if he's just a trade ship, I love having him late. Um, and Bogdanovich, I think people are sort of a little too down on him. Um, we kind of, you know, yes, they played last year without Cade, um, and Cade coming back, like he's going to have more of an offensive role. I, I get that. But I think we often as a fan base and especially as a community, as a fantasy community, we're a little more eager to take touches away from the proven vets than actual NBA teams are. Um, and, you know, maybe he gets traded at some point, you know, maybe he does have a massive drop off. Uh, I, I, I think that especially in the 12th round, what are we looking at? Pick 130 something here. Uh, this is, just the upside far outweighs the downside at for at cost here. And, you know, it, in the late rounds, I like to sort of balance proven veterans who, you know, are going later than they should. Maybe they don't have top 75 upside, but they're probably going 20 spots too late with these home run swings of shaded sharp, Derek lively, uh, Jeremy Sohan, another name on this queue that I had. Nemhart was on this queue. You got to be going a little bit deeper to actually draft Nemhart. Um, you're probably more looking at him as a late pick in a 14-team league or a 16-team league. Um, but he's a name that I have 
sort of on my radar in a deeper league. Um, and the last name on my queue, um, I, other names on my queue, Kevin Herter sort of fit my build, but I'm glad I didn't have to get there. Um, <laughs> Keontae George, another rookie. I, I'd rather Lively, I'd rather Sharp, who's a fake rookie, um, but um, but Keontae George uh, is a, if you're trying for this late round rookie approach that I advocate, he's a reasonable target. Wait a minute. Um, I, I, I need to know more. What, what constitutes a fake rookie? Is that a, a faux, a, 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 a fooky? I can't, I gotta be careful. I pronounce that. I, he's, he's sharp. I mean, he's, he's not a rookie. He's, he's, yeah. um, but he, has I want to, I want to make this a game now. experience. He has limited game experience. He's 20 years old. He's kind of raw and he's Fake got this sort of massive upside. He's <laughs> for the purposes of this exercise. I can pretend he's a rookie, even though yeah, he's fair. very much not. And the other thing, the other thing that's, I think key for the fake rookie, because I'm also, I hadn't realized that I'd made this internal cal- classification um, before this conversation, but I actually, I have Sohan in the same category in my head. I'm thinking of Sharp and Sohan as, cause I'm always advocating don't draft a rookie early, do draft them late. But this year uh, I'm, I'm finding that I'm pulling the trigger on the Thompson twins a little later than most people. So I'm not often getting them, which means that the only actual rookie that I'm likely to get is Derek Lively in a standard league. Cause otherwise all the rookies are gone. Um, but I still like this strategy. I still believe in it. So how do I, how do I pull it in? If I don't have a rookie, get, that a, I think fake fits, rookie. get a fake rookie of and course. I have, t- and I have two and it's sharp and Sohan, both of whom are young, both of who, like, I, I think they're both 20. Um, and both of them are in new situations where more will be asked of them. Um, for sharp, it's the very obvious Lillard no longer there. Um, Sohan just, they brought him along so slowly and then they gave him a ton of minutes kind of late. And now it seems like they kind of want him to be maybe a start, if not a starter, like a very core figure. There's been talk about maybe him being point guard some of the time. Um, who knows what's going to happen with him, but I kind of want to be on board to find out. Um, so I, I, yeah, fake rookies apparently is a thing that I've been thinking about for months and didn't realize. You heard it today, ladies and gentlemen, a brand new term in fantasy sports. Rickling pioneers, the fake are, rookie. Are there others that I am missing that I, that we should be including here? I have no idea. I'm going to have to like, <laughs> I need I'm you to do to a fake, yeah, fake rookie deep dive. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I, we, I feel like we need a new name for sleepers. Now we've got <laughs> fake rookies. This is outstanding. I'm, I'm over the moon. Um, and um, Rezenkoff was the last name on my queue. You were saying. Oh, there you go. Uh, Kings, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I know I saw a few tweets. A real about, rookie. Yeah, an actual. <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe you'll end up on your team. So maybe really you do, you forget advocating drafting rookies late. Maybe it's the fake rookie that's, get that that's part of new, your brand. Yeah. Uh, Walker, see. Kessler, yeah. and fake rookies. That's the move. I guess if you're in a deeper league, could you argue Dyson Daniels is a fake rookie? Yeah, that's probably fake rookie. Uh, yeah. uh, Cause there's a bunch of injuries there right now. Uh-huh. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe. It's sort of raw, kind of young. Hmm. Uh, um, I'm going to yeah. need, I'm going to need a list. I think at some <laughs> point, cause you know me, I don't even look at a player until they turn 27. <laughs> oh, Jovich, Nikola Jovich of the heat. If you yeah. believe that he's stepping into an, a big role, that's definitely a fake rookie. He didn't even, <laughs> Jovich is definitely. Uh, let me I, see how many minutes did he play last year? Just total. You, you could, yeah, I was gonna say go for totals. Forget per game. You could probably get a total that's. We yeah. may need to establish cutoffs here. What <laughs> constitutes how many total minutes can they have? Because Sohan might have priced himself out by total yeah. minutes. Yeah, he, he might have. Uh, yeah, two hundred four minutes across fifteen games. Jovich oh, yeah. is a hundred percent a fake rookie. Hundred percent fake rookie. <laughs> yeah, no one can argue with you on that one. <laughs> Rickling, I love you, buddy. These are always a blast. I'm I've been horrible. I need everybody to know, and I'll say this every time I talk to a guest, but you in particular, <laughs> I suck so hard at scheduling. My schedule is such an insane cluster mess. 
Um, so thank you for bearing with me on that. Thank you for like slotting in. Cause you're like, I'm free every evening. And I'm like, I can't do anything any <laughs> ever. Uh, so thank you, uh, for making the no time. Glad, glad you could make me. it work. I promise. I promise this is real that I'm going to be better this year. <laughs> Some kind of resolution, whether it was for Rosh Hashanah or the, or the regular January 1st one, some resolution is going to kick in and I'm going to do a better job at this crap. Um, uh, so thank you. It's the short version of that. Uh, he is Alex Rickling at R I K L E E N. He is one of my favorite people in the fantasy space. And we always have a blast. Alex, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me. I love that dude. We didn't talk about as many old dudes this, the, uh, this time as usual. He had a, I mean, I guess the beginning Steph is older, but that doesn't count. The first rounders, you don't like, he didn't do the old guy thing except for Conley. I should have stopped and done more Conley. Why didn't I yell about Conley more? I love I love old dudes on a team. Ah, uh, well. Um, shout out to our buddies at manscaped.com. Promo code there is ethos20. You get 20% off and free shipping on your order, including the brand new Handyman. That's an actual face razor. Uh, not razor, face uh, electric razor. That's the word I'm looking for. I actually used it in this cheek area here, which as you can see, is very well taken care of even though the rest of my personal hygiene is uh, suboptimal. Um, take a moment to, again, follow Alex on Twitter. I am at Dan Bespris over on social media. Like, subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff on your way out. Coming up on Fantasy NBA Today, nothing more today, actually. We're done uh, for Tuesday. Two shows in the morning. I'll rest my voice because I was on four pods yesterday. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be talking to Brew in the morning, which is always a, an awesome time, especially now as we approach the start of the season. Aaron Brewski's brain starting to leak out of his ears, so we'll see what, what pours out onto the show on tomorrow's episode as well. Uh, we should have an episode coming up pretty soon with Dan Titus, an episode with Matt Smith, an episode with Josh Lloyd. We will have the Dan Bespris Old Man Squad uh, and some of my, and I can't think of the right way to phrase it, but just some of my favorite picks this year for whatever series of reasons good values fun players to have whatever i know that i have self-branded myself as the fantasy analyst who doesn't actually like to have any fun playing fantasy sports but there are a handful of guys out there that bring me a small measure of joy we'll do a little bit of a show on those as well uh have a great tuesday everybody thanks so much for watching we'll see you soon